when we get underway. Welcome to IWP. Um, discussion today by Steve Knott of the Naval War College. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with IWP, uh, we are an independent graduate school of National Security Affairs. We we'll offer three full master's degrees, uh, an executive and, as well as an executive and a, and a professional one in 18 different uh, certificates. Uh, my name is Mac Owens. I'm the dean here. And one of the cool things about being the dean is I get to invite my friends to talk. And Paul, Professor Paul Coyer and I uh, had a fight over who was going to introduce uh, Steve this time because it turned out that since I've known him the longest, I, I get to do it. So, um, the uh, just a little bit about Steve, Professor Steve Knott of the Naval War College. Did I say that? Yes, I did. Um, he is one of our foremost uh, presidential historians, and. Um, he has taught at the University of Virginia uh, a long time at the Naval War College. He was also the um, co-chair of the UVA's uh, Presidential Oral History Program. He also directed the Ronald Reagan Oral History Project. He was on the staff of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library. His PhD is in political science from Boston College. And in addition to the War College, he has taught at the Air Force Academy and, as I said, UVA. His books uh, include Rush to Judgment, George W. Bush, The War on Terror and His Critics, Secret and Sanctioned, Covert Operation of the American Presidency. Uh, by, by the way, he spoke on that book several months ago here. Um, and uh, Alexander Hamilton, The Persistence of Myth. Uh, we happen to share an affinity for uh, Mr. Hamilton, and uh, his basically the, the, the this book is is excellent in the sense that it, it looks at the way that Hamilton has been portrayed through American history. Uh, he's had his ups and his downs and so forth, and recently he um, had a musical about it that is Mr. Hamilton did, and Steve uh, actually wrote and produced the uh, the. Uh, um, he uh, actually, very important book, uh, the most recent book is uh, Washington and Hamilton, The Alliance That Forged America. And this is a remarkable book, uh, actually he co-authored with one of our common students. And uh, it's, it's really had, a, I think, an impact on the way you think about this. What he's going to talk about it today is uh, the theme that he raised in his book on uh, on George Bush. The different ways uh, that uh, historians treat presidents. And the title of his book, Rush, Rush to Judgment. I mean, people can criticize uh, George Bush all they want, and they have. And his book is not a defense per se of Bush, but it is to, it's a, it's a critique of his uh, of his um, <coughs> fellow uh, presidential scholars who, you know, just immediately attacked George Bush without letting the dust <coughs> settle. Uh, so that will be the topic that he's uh, going to address today. So please uh, join me in welcoming Steve Knott. Thank you, Mr. Well, thank you all for being here. I know it's a beautiful day. It would be very tempting to be outside enjoying this, <coughs> excuse me, terrific spring weather. But uh, I appreciate you coming here today. Uh, so as my good friend Max said, and by the way, I also would like to thank Paul Coyer for arranging this. Uh, as my good friend Max just said, I'm going to be talking today about what I see as the scholarly double standards that exist in terms of how <coughs> the academic community, primarily historians and political scientists, uh, determine so-called presidential greatness. Um, <clears throat> one can see in the contrast between the treatment metered out to Presidents George W. Bush and Barack Obama, uh, I see as a confirmation that two sets of rules prevail when it comes to scholarly assessments of American presidents. Uh, Democratic presidents tend to be excused when it comes to assertive uses of national security policy, while Republican presidents are deemed lawless. 
And President Obama, in my view, is the most recent beneficiary of this double standard that distorts scholarly assessments of the nation's chief executives. Now, it is important to note that throughout the 20th century, scholars such as Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., and colleagues of his, such as Richard Neustadt and James McGregor Burns, all champion broad presidential powers over national security. However, uh, many of these progressive scholars who promoted a vision of Wilsonianism on steroids had some sober second thoughts regarding presidential power in the wake of Vietnam and Watergate. But it really took the ascension of Richard Nixon for this sobering up to occur. And this transformation was most evident in the works of Schlesinger, James McGregor Burns, Richard Neustadt, Henry Steele Commager, all of whom believed with minor differences of emphasis in Burns's notion of presidential government. However, when Richard Nixon was elected in 1968, these men suddenly discovered the importance of limiting presidential power. Nixon's decision to slowly de-escalate America's involvement in Vietnam was one of many factors in the abandonment by scholars of their endorsement of an activist presidency, as was, to be blunt, their loathing of the man who represented all that they detested in contemporary American politics. Schlesinger and Commager, who had once attacked critics of President Truman's undeclared war in Korea, now criticized President Nixon for invading Cambodia without congressional authorization. Critics of Truman's exercise of the war power, Henry Steel Commager once argued, were objecting on grounds, quote, that have no support in law or history while Arthur Schlesinger found such arguments, quote, demonstrably irresponsible. Richard Neustadt also defended Harry Truman's handling of the Korean War, claiming that the president's job was to, quote, make decisions and to take initiatives. Neustadt wrote in his book, Presidential Power, that this was a book uh, for a man who seeks to maximize his power and Neustadt later offered an open-ended endorsement of executive power. And the quote that I'd like to read to you from Neustadt's classic book is, quote, when it comes to action risking war, technology has modified the Constitution. The president, perforce, becomes the only man in the system capable of exercising judgment under the extraordinary limits now imposed by secrecy, complexity, and time. He added that, quote, the president remains our system's great initiator. When we once called war, when what we once called war intends, he now becomes our system's final arbiter. And Neustadt, along with Schlesinger and Commager, considered Franklin Roosevelt to be something of a model president. And all of these men at various points criticized <laughs> Dwight Eisenhower as a, quote, amateur, end quote, for his alleged passivity. But Neustadt, in particular, began having second thoughts, as I said, with an activist Nixon White House. Over time, Nixon's transgressions prompted Neustadt and others to write about the importance of sharing power. Neustadt's position on presidential power continued to evolve in this direction, particularly when another Republican president, George W. Bush, and his neoconservative junior ministers, as Neustadt called them, appeared to disregard the limits on the presidency embedded in the Constitution. Many of Neustadt's uh, contemporaries, academic colleagues, uh, continue to believe, uh, and this is a quote here from Eric Fonner, who's a prominent history professor at Columbia University. Uh, Fonner argued that Bush, quote, had taken his disdain for law even further than Richard Nixon, and that Bush, quote, sought to strip people accused of crimes of rights that date as far back as the Magna Carta. Historian Robert Dalek echoed the Nixon comparison, noting that from his reading of the New York Times 10 plus years ago, <clears throat> Dalek had concluded that he, Bush, has abused power. I wouldn't say necessarily the same against him as Richard Nixon, but sui generis. 
he may have abused power in his own special way. Dalek was so appalled by Bush's presidency that he proposed an amendment to the Constitution that would allow for the recall of a sitting president. After securing passage of a 60% majority in both houses of Congress, the American public would then vote yes or no to remove the president and the vice president, who would then be replaced by the Speaker of the House. Arthur Schlesinger Jr., who, as I'm sure many of you know, coined the term imperial presidency, and I think had a tendency to apply that term rather liberally to Republican presidents, at first considered George W. Bush to be an amiable mediocrity, but would later see him as a threat to the Republic. Schlesinger observed in April 2004 that it appears to be once again the politics of fear and the imperial presidency redux. We have been through paranoid phases before, succumbing to panic and forgetting our constitutional guarantees. Schlesinger would later add that the presidency of George W. Bush presented the most dramatic, sustained, and radical challenge to the rule of law in American history. Schlesinger would go on to add that what, what Bush was attempting to do uh, with his war in Iraq and the broader war on terror was to secure American hegemony over the inferior races. Echoing Arthur Schlesinger's fears, historian Joyce Appleby claimed that the founders never imagined a Bush administration. And she issued a call in 2006 for the public to wake up to this constitutional crisis. Pulitzer Prize winner Joseph Ellis echoed this theme, saying with Bush in 2009, I think that George W. Bush might very well be the worst president in American history. He's unusual. Most two-term presidents have a mixed record. Bush has nothing on the positive side, virtually nothing. Historian Douglas Brinkley, the author of a glowing 2004 biography of John Kerry, observed that it's safe to bet that Bush will be forever handcuffed to the bottom rungs of the presidential ladder. He has joined Herbert Hoover as a case study on how not to be president. And Brinkley would later add that President Bush was a good man, but he was so infuriated and angered by the events of 9-11 that he put on his ideological blinders and forgot that we have other things we represent, civil liberties here at home and the Constitution. George W. Bush, according to Brinkley, is one of the five worst presidents in American history. To make matters worse, Douglas Brinkley claimed that Bush believed in bullying over the power of persuasion and purposely tried to brutalize his opponents. Historian H.W. Branch echoed the Herb Brands, excuse me, echoed the Herbert Hoover theme while contemplating George W. Bush's presidency. Before Bush, Americans could have guns and butter. After Bush, we'll be lucky simply to have butter. Pulitzer Prize, I know these things sometimes hard to believe. <coughs> Pulitzer Prize winner Gary Wills, not to be outdone by his ideological peers in the academy, argued that not only was Bush the worst president, quote, a strong claim could be made that Dick Cheney was the worst vice president and Alberto Gonzalez was the worst attorney general. And Bush's reelection for Gary Wills marked the death of modernity for it was the day the Enlightenment went out. Another Pulitzer winner, Stanford history professor Jack Racco, argued that Bush's use of signing statements meant that the United States faced a constitutional crisis. And if this practice were not halted, our freedoms will become a thing of the past, impossible to recover. The dean of the Harvard Law School, Elena Kagan, now on the Supreme Court, declared that the Bush administration's efforts to strip the courts of jurisdiction in cases involving captured terrorists held at Guantanamo Bay were comparable to the actions of dictatorships and fundamentally lawless. Kagan's law school counterpart, the dean uh, at the Yale Law School, uh, Harold Coe, who would later go on to be the State Department counsel under <coughs> President Obama, 
wrote that the Bush administration's disregard for international law had earned it a place in the, quote, axis of disobedience, along with Kim, Kim Jong-il's North Korea and Saddam Hussein's Iraq. The visceral animus that many American scholars felt towards the Bush-Cheney regime, that was the word of choice for the Bush presidency, uh, bordered on the unprofessional and made a mockery of the principle of academic objectivity. A typical example of this animus occurred at the annual meeting of the American Historical Association in New York City in January 2009. The Bush-Cheney years of Historians Against the War Roundtable featured history faculty from Columbia, Yale, Trinity College, New York University, and Yeshiva University. These scholars compared the Bush regime's security practices to those of Joseph McCarthy and of assorted war criminals. <laughs> One scholar was appalled that in the 2008 election, Barack Obama's relationship with William Ayers, the member of the Students for Democratic Society, was more of an issue than Senator John McCain's bombing missions over North Vietnam. The cover of the roundtable's report featured Bush and Cheney seated on a pile of human skulls. Now, some of those examples that I just gave you were approaching almost 10 years old, but this, this trend, this tendency, particularly to, in my view, sort of demonize the presidency of George W. Bush, and by the way, I'm not standing up here making the case that Bush was a great president by any stretch, but hopefully my point is coming through. The latest example of this sort of uh, ongoing scholarly demonization of Bush can be seen in a biography that was released last year by Gene Edward Smith, the author of a terrific book on George, uh, George uh, John Marshall, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, um, I think Ulysses X. Grant, if I'm not mistaken. You know, solid, solid biographies, award-winning biographies. He published a biography of George W. Bush last year called Bush uh, in 2016. And again, Smith is the latest to argue that George W. Bush was a lawless chief executive contemptuous <coughs> of the rule of law. Uh, in Smith's account, the nation's 43rd president was subject to, quote, these are all quotes, Bouts of braggadocio hubris, suffered from a short attention span, was guilty of anti-intellectualism, was untutored and unread, and prone to macho assertiveness, and strutted around like a cowboy. Bush, according to Smith, was also possessed of a willfulness that borders on psychosis. Now, this book, which I just had to review, which was a painful experience, but uh, this book is, is just tainted by this constant barrage of hyperbolic and at times sophomoric criticism. Smith implies that the Bush family operated in a way similar to the character in the film The Godfather, does that twice, and observes that George W. Bush resembled Big Brother in George Orwell's 1984. And this is due in part to Bush's Seem, being seemingly unaware of the constitutional guarantees of individual liberty. Smith also, in my view, grotesquely asserts that the war on terror was, in Bush's eyes, the equivalent of an athletic contest, something we have to win today before the game next week. Smith also claims that George W. Bush recruited Christianity in order to launch another crusade against the evildoers of the Muslim world. And for those of you who have sort of can recall this period of time or have looked back on this period of time, uh, the idea that Bush believed in some sort of crusade, although he did mistakenly use that term once, um, against the Muslim world is just patently false. Bush refused, much to the distress of his conservative base, to label the war on terror as a struggle against Islam and went out of his way to embrace Islamic Americans. In fact, within a week of 9-11, visited the mosque not far from where we speak, where we sit here today, 
um, within days of 9-11 and made a point of telling his fellow Americans that any discrimination against Islamic Americans would simply not be tolerated. And Bush categorically rejected the race-based abuses of civil liberties authorized by Franklin Roosevelt, who, ironically enough, Gene Edward Smith and a number of the academics that I've cited today uh, revere. Bush believed that the war in Iraq, according to Smith, was a biblical struggle of good versus evil, something from the pages of the book of Revelation. Bush's messianic conviction distorted his leadership as he led America impulsively into war. And to compound, compound matters, he was in over his head. He opted for war rather than working through the comity of nations, whatever that is, and in complete disregard for the rule of law. The author accuses Bush of exacerbating the events of 9-11 by blustering about war and reinforcing the nation's fears. Now, there's no mention made in Smith's book of the CIA's report to President Bush within a couple of weeks of 9-11 that Al-Qaeda had smuggled into New York City a 10 kiloton nuclear weapon. And in fact, it was already in New York. Uh, and that's part of sort of an overall dismissal of Smith, of dismissal of the significance of 9-11. He notes at one point that the number of lives lost on 9-11 were comparable to the deaths of pedestrians killed annually by trucks and automobiles. In fact, outside of two natural disasters, September 11th, 2001 was the deadliest day in American history since the Battle of Antietam in September 1862. The toll on 9-11 was higher than that at Pearl Harbor or on the first, on the first day of the American landings at D-Day. Remarkably, Smith, and he's not alone here, condemns Bush for failing to examine quote, the reasons behind Al-Qaeda's quarrel with the West. Now, I would argue that Al-Qaeda had hardly had a quarrel with the West, and it's not at all clear how Bush would have benefited from a deeper understanding of Al-Qaeda's apocalyptic <laughs> ideology. The American attack on Afghanistan in October 2001 was a war of aggression, according to Smith, rather than a congressionally authorized attack on a government that sheltered Al-Qaeda and balked at expelling them from their country. And Smith also reiterates the discredited claim, which still exists, is still out there, that the Bush administration pressured the CIA to cook the books regarding Saddam Hussein's WMD program. And there's no mention of the fact that the bipartisan uh, Rob Silverman, Silberman Commission found no evidence of political pressure to influence the intelligence community's pre-war assessments of Iraq's WMD program. Let me conclude by noting that despite the record, and I'd rather get to your questions than stand up here talking at you, despite the record of progressive presidents pushing their national security powers to the extreme, it is George W. Bush who is seen as something of an unprecedented threat to the constitutional order a budding tyrant, while Barack Obama, I would say sort of a premature winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, is rarely described by scholars in these same terms. Until academics assess presidential power on principled rather than ideological grounds, in other words, adopt a consistent posture regarding presidential power, regardless of whether a D or an R follows the president's name, a substantial portion of the American public will dismiss scholarly assessments as partisan camp. Too many scholars, not to mention journalists, place their devotion to the Constitution in a blind trust when judging a Democrat in the White House. These partisan scholars undermine the credibility of the academy and facilitated the rise of those who propagate alternative facts. Regrettably, the record of blatant scholarly bias toward Republican presidents allows the Trump administration to claim, with some justification, that you cannot believe the accounts offered by scholars 
nor by any so-called experts. And that truly is cause for concern for the health and well-being of the American Republic. Thank you. Hopefully I've generated some questions here today. Anybody? I um, read uh, someone else I know wrote a review of Smith's book, uh, Will Inland. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. That? Yes. And Will's experience was just as painful as yours in getting through the book. And Will, like you, had previous respect for his previous work, and so was quite actually shocked that he had produced such shoddy scholarship. And I think Will found that he had actually used Wikipedia in some cases oh, really? as source material. Yeah. And in other cases, had just quoted and accepted. <laughs> Blindly, the New York Times uh, analysis of Bush, yeah. which was obviously still against him, and didn't do. Uh, I think. I think he, I don't think he actually. Correct me if I'm wrong. Did one interview with a a Bush staff, senior Bush staffer I, who could give his point of view and, and defend Bush. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he interviewed Cheney. Did he? Um, right. But well, I know he did interview Will, and Will was a senior director yeah. of the NSC. Yeah. Uh, and several other Bill's colleagues didn't get called. So sure. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's clear that Smith was determined to get this book out to, I don't know if it was to settle, he had written a book about George H.W. Bush. Uh, it came out just after the first Gulf War that was almost equally as critical. So there's something about the Bush family, or at least the Bush family and its exercise of war powers, that really rubs him the wrong way. In fact, Throughout this latest book, Smith routinely refers to Bush 41 as Poppy, which I thought, again, it just strikes me as juvenile. Yeah. And, and it's trying to sort of uh, keep to, on the forefront of the reader's mind that this Bush 43 is kind of a spoiled little brat descended from Yale aristocracy, from, from Poppy. Um, and it's, it's just filled with that kind of those polemics. Um, now, he does have good things to say about George W. Bush's uh, programs in Africa to halt the spread of AIDS. It's actually fairly effusive in his praise for Bush there, but that's probably maybe 10 or 20 pages out of a three or 400 page book. He's somewhat um, praiseworthy of Bush's actions after the stock market collapse, the housing collapse in the NOA, but most of it reads like what I just conveyed to you. There's, there's even more. I didn't want to overwhelm you with that. Yes, sir. So um, in that particular reality as far as the Bush administration, what was it like from a personal assistant or maybe someone who was in the White House, like um, Carrie Ann Conley that could have worked closely with the president at the time that maybe wasn't trying to do his work for him, wasn't trying to, you know, mimic or mock him to the point where it's like, hey, this is my personal assistant, but they're not the president. And I bring that up until a lot of the guilt and shame that can come into an administration when you might have a dogmatic censorship or very, you know, we're not running C-SPAN here, then the propaganda can go out from the White House as if the president is not in control of the country or of his presidency, but you have like all of these staffers within the White House. And I'm not saying Kerry and Conley is an example of a modern day Bush administration by no stretch, but there's a lot of guilt and shame in what goes on in the White House and how the president, I will say, loses legitimacy based on what's either being reported through C-SPAN or whatever's going on in Capitol Hill that says, you know, that report that we got doesn't support the president's agenda and then that's more of like okay that's just making the you know nightly news of the news like what's not really giving us the economy it's not really giving us the president's political agenda okay so i'm not so you're talking about media distortion and well i was i was kind of following up on what he was talking about it seems like a lot of republicans get caught up in dirty politics for whatever reason um, and when we make these types of, you know, assumptions or we laugh these things off, there really is something that should be talked more about as far as the economy, taxes. We're not saying make it so conservative where the rest of the nation is sitting and saying, you know what, this is a taxpayer party on the military's, you know, free lunch program. So there is, I think, dirty politics that kind of gets spewed out there in the actual media 
when we have a Republican seat, presidency, but is that really just making the nightly news or is it, okay, there is someone in the White House or Kerry Ann Connolly, maybe at the time of that particular administration, that was giving a false image about what the staff does for the president and then what the actual president does to ensure that he has his supporters who voted for him. Uh, yeah, look, I would, I mean, as far as dirty politics goes, there's, there's plenty. Uh, again, I would say it's more of a bipartisan phenomenon. Uh, I could have talked about, no, I didn't, but I could have talked about, no, I don't consider this dirty politics at all, but it's of questionable constitutionality, I guess, and some people were offended by it. I mean, the Obama administration used drone strikes against American citizens. They killed American citizens. I personally happen to think that was the right thing to do, but I can guarantee you if that had happened under George W. Bush, there would have been hell to pay. That, that would have been evidence of lawlessness, of an abuse of power, of depriving an American citizen of his constitutional rights. I'm talking about the Durham strikes against Anwar al Malaki and I think his son, and then there was another incident, but I think three American citizens were killed by drone strikes. Again, I don't have a problem with this. These people are Al Qaeda allies, um, but again, if that had happened under Bush, it would have been, been an article of impeachment. The washing of the hands in this current administration, where people are now doing a report out in the news talking about where up to three foot out of pedal, it seems like the Trump administration is trying to get out of Occupy Wall Street, whatever the Bush administration is doing, and the country is kind of up to three foot out of pedal now under this Republican presidency who's kind of washed their hands with the former Republican presidency. Yeah, I, yeah, sorry, I've gone as far as I can go with this. Um, yeah. Forgive me if this is a bit of a chicken and the egg kind of question. Sure. But when you're thinking, talk about like, you know, the lack of integrity of young scholars, does the blame fall on scholars for writing this way or does the blame fall on the wider public and now we can see public that's even more partisanly divided with, in general, attitudes on both sides of the aisle that are, my guys can't do wrong, their guys can't do right. So who do you, who do you blame? Do you blame the scholars, like scholarly community, for <clears throat> bad publications, or is it sort of following the voter who wants to uh, digest? Well, look, I, I, uh, being a member of the academy, I, I would like to think that those of us who are allegedly committed to the life of the mind, and to reason over passion, would actually follow reason over passion. Uh, but instead, what you saw, particularly during the Bush years, I think, was it brought out the worst in the professoriate. It, it brought out their ideological, I mean, we always sort of knew it was there. Uh, clearly, most historians, uh, probably most political scientists, lean left somewhat. Uh, but the usual sort of, uh, you know, allowing a president to sort of, uh, I mean, one thing historians are supposed to be about is you do a lot of unsexy archival research, you do a lot of interviews, uh, you might even wait 20 years for a lot of classified information to come out, and then you del and you do oral history interviews, which I did for six or seven years. Um, and you, you assemble all that, you let the passions cool, then you make your pronouncement and your judgments. This did not happen uh, in the Bush years, particularly. Uh, Sean Wilentz, who is the editor of the New York Times series on the American presidents, and is arguably one of the most prominent American historians in the country, historians of American history, um, uh, proclaimed in a piece in Rolling Stone magazine in the spring of 06 that the Bush presidency was a colossal failure, perhaps the worst president in American history. It's not even over yet. I mean, arguably the worst is yet to come. But, uh, you know, you don't, that, that's, that's um, abandoning your scholarly and your professional obligations so as to become a talking head, you know, to become a pundit, uh, which is great. You know, a lot of, I kind of like going on TV once in a while. It's fun. Uh, but that's, that's not scholarship. That's uh, his opinion is no better in 2006 than you and I from reading the New York Times that day. And yet they wrap themselves in the mantle of their profession um, as experts. And so I put more of the onus 
on the scholars than I do on the, the reading public who would expect, I think, expect some level, some attempt at objectivity. And that, that just went out the window, particularly during Bush years and to some extent during the Obama years when I think it kind of flipped uh, the other way and it was a tendency to ignore certain things that might, might generate criticism under a Republican president. So, you know, Sean Wilentz is free to go on MSNBC or to write a piece for Rolling Stone, as you are or I am. But don't wrap yourself in the mantle of somehow having some special insight as a professional historian. Yes, sir. There has been a critique along the lines of it's become, let's see, academia has become increasingly leftist as the degree of public funding of universities has increased. Do you see that? Is That's that an interesting is point. That maybe part of the answer to scale back that funding or an act of fairness doctrine that applies <laughs> yeah. to, you know, to NSR, NPR, and academia, or at least taxpayer-funded academics? Yeah, that's an interesting point. I've never really thought of it through that lens. I, I, I guess I would lean away from that a bit in that particularly the history profession has always been, you know, long before any sort of government assistance or federal financial aid to education, has always been sort of leaning in that direction. I mean, part of it is as, as scholars, you're sort of encouraged to question the conventional narrative and you're encouraged to sort of push back uh, against what authority figures tell you. Uh, and particularly in history, you sort of always discover kind of layers of the truth and you have to dig for it. So there's just a kind of natural skepticism, I think, uh, in the scholarly profession. But again, it's particularly pronounced, I think, in Republican presidencies, in part because Republican presidencies are less friendly to the scholarly community. There aren't people like an Arthur Schlesinger who worked for President Kennedy. There aren't, that I was aware of, there aren't similar types in the George W. Bush White House. It's like Kissinger going to Nixon was such a big deal. Exactly, yeah. And Daniel Patrick Moynihan went to Nixon for briefly. Uh, and that was, that was a big deal, as you said, Paul, and somewhat unusual. Uh, Republicans tend to draw more from the business community, I think, and that that causes a certain friction with academics who aren't necessarily keen on, on business. Uh, I, I, I grant you, I'm painting with a broad brush here. Uh, it's a very interesting point that I've never thought of. It's possible that this kind of aid has sort of aggravated the situation. But I do think there's a natural scholarly inclination against tradition and against conservative traditional beliefs. Including religion, by the way. That was one factor in the antagonism towards Bush. This notion that he wore his religion on his sleeve. Go ahead, follow up. And I try to parrot something Stephen Pinker, now at Harvard, is fond of uh, criticizing the social sciences and saying what's happening right now is evolution theory is now which is science, is encroaching on the social scientists who are fighting tooth and nail because they prefer to just, you know, they prefer their stories and they really don't, they'd rather reason it from their first principles and, and tying the facts really isn't a priority. Is it in the history area? Is there, there isn't, there's no evolution. There's nothing comparable at least that I can see that forces historians to be grounded. So is it just because they have the freedom to, I mean, there's, there's no fact chasing them, forcing them to? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I'm following your argument, but in a sense, I mean, I think I am. Yes, in that historians in particular, perhaps rightly so, approach their craft with a degree of skepticism. They are not going to accept the accepted wisdom at face value. And so the tendency is to be constantly questioning, constantly probing, which is a great thing, 
Uh, but it does, I think, it has, a, there's a danger there. It ends up becoming a, almost a religion. And so there's a dismissal of any sort of uh, conventional narrative, traditional, or the word that comes from authorities like in the White House. Yeah, that's about as far as I can go with it. But great, great points. Yes, sir. Do you see the same sort of this uh, polarization toward uh, this candidate, uh, 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 winners of uh, uh, elections in other countries, presidents, historians huh. in other countries? And do you see it with the Reagan administration here? Well, I'm, thanks. I, I, I'm really not equipped to, to comment on the attitude of historians in other countries. I just have not done any comparative work, although I would be shocked to discover that they are a, a conservative faction who tends to be pro, pro-government, pro, you know, pro-authority. That would, I doubt it. Um, I do know the Reagan administration. I do, you know, I spent, uh, as Max said, Six years doing oral histories of both Reagan advocates and Reagan opponents, people who worked for him, people who fought against him. Um, initially, uh, when Reagan left office uh, in January of 89, uh, most historians were highly, highly critical of him. Uh, and it took, you know, it took a few years for Reagan's reputation to begin to turn. Now, it helped when the Soviet Union collapsed and the wall came down. And at least in the mind of some, Reagan appeared to be vindicated. Now, today, uh, C-SPAN just did a poll in February that was released, uh, I think, 99 or so, including me, uh, academics who were surveyed. And Reagan was, I believe, in the top 10, uh, you know, 8, 9, or 10, somewhere in there. So he's, he's kind of come around a bit, but it, it, it took a while. Um, it really took a while. And I think for some of the, some historians, they had to swallow quite hard. Uh, it does help to be a dead Republican. Um, if you're still alive and you still have either family members, like the Bush family with Jeb Bush, uh, that, I think, fosters this antagonism and doesn't allow for a passion-free assessment of the presidency. Reagan had no real heirs um, who were interested in politics, so I think it hastened the process. Uh, and, you know, as much as I criticize, I think I mentioned Sean Valence earlier, he actually wrote a book about the Reagan presidency that I would, I would say is relatively fair-minded, shockingly so. Um, so I have to give him that. Yes, sir. I'm thinking how to say this. <laughs> um, you never know, no matter what you say during campaign, you never know what he's going to do until you get the power. And people react differently. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking uh, does Texas, Texas mentality have anything to do with Texas? It? Yeah. yeah. Or Bush family mentality has anything to do with it? it many factors. Yeah there in you know, absolutely uh, and one thing that by the way i i voted for hw and w just, just as well um one thing that he just disappointed me was that his father along with uh grant scope craft mm -hmm. they both told him not to go into True. iraq don't do that. Well, you know what? In Japan, you, you go against your father. Yeah. There is a saying, it's going to be fail. Yeah. yeah. And look what happened. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I, I no. don't know how to say this thing. No, no. That's good. So, by the way, your reference to text, I mean, it, there's no doubt in my mind the fact that George W. Bush was from Texas worked against him in a lot of quarters, particularly in the scholarly community. And I quoted, you know, Paul, uh, Gene Edward Smith talking about Bush strutting around like a cowboy and his braggadocio and his macho posturing. That, that repeats itself throughout a lot of academic criticism of Bush. This macho posturing coupled with his alleged coziness with Texas-based firms like Halliburton, of course Dick Cheney had been a major figure, 
in Halliburton. The whole Texas thing was an issue, particularly for scholars at elite universities, where there really is this varying degrees of animus towards folks from the South, particularly from Texas. Texas seems to personify a kind of cockiness that rubs academics the wrong way. And Texas was also the place that killed the sainted John F. Kennedy, to be blunt. That's how they see it. I'm not accusing Texas of doing that, but that's, you know, that's there. I mean, I live in Massachusetts, trust me, that's there. And this notion that somehow this atmosphere of hate in Dallas killed who many of these progressives view to be the beau ideal of an American president, that still resonates. Now, the fact that, as Jackie Kennedy put it, a silly little communist killed her husband, that's dismissed. It's this atmosphere of hate. It's Lamar Hunt or H.L. Hunt. It's, it's oil. It's right-wing crazies who killed President Kennedy. Maybe Richard <laughs> was in Dallas the day before yeah, President Kennedy. You better, LBJ. And then, and, then, <laughs> and then, of course, LBJ. And the Kennedy folks who used to refer to LBJ behind his back as Colonel Cornpone, among other things, uh, you know, the fact that he went to Southwest Texas State University instead of Harvard, you know. Now, George W. Bush did go to Yale. He did go to, uh, was it Philip Sandover Academy? Uh, I think so. You know, went to Harvard for his MBA, uh, but that wasn't enough to sort of take that Texas edge off. Couple that with his wearing his religion on his sleeve, and that was a death sentence. I mean, when, when he said during one of his debates with Al Gore, uh, who your favorite political philosopher was, and he answered Jesus Christ, that <laughs> appalled all the right-thinking folks up on the Charles River. So, Great talk. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I guess my reaction is <clears throat> first, uh, it's not so much dirty politics as just politics. Uh, and uh, as much fun as you had putting together this particular litany, uh, I'm sure a body could put together a comparable litany of, of uh, silliness about, you know, a Democrat. Um, so let me suggest that maybe it's, it's not so much, as I think actually the latter part of your talk, you may brought up. It's not so much a just a lack of scholarship and lack of discipline. It is that. Uh, in part, it points to the fact of just how few true historians are out there. Mm. You know, the idea of contemporary history is maybe a oxymoron. Mm. John Meacham was on MSNBC once a week to talk about these mm -hmm. kind of things. Um, but it's a crafting of narrative. Yeah. Right? And it's, a, it's the prioritization of narrative because somebody has to write the history and it might as well be me. Yeah. So it's a politicization of narrative. Um, all of which is to, to bring to the question, do you therefore uh, maybe subscribe or point to the, the old maxim that you know, it has to be 20 or 50 years before it's real history? Before, you, before, as you said, the passions can cool. Anything short of that yeah. is current affairs. Yeah, great point, great question. I do subscribe to that maxim that one should wait 20 years before proclaiming a president, at least 20 years, at least. I mean, by the way, there's still material in the John F. Kennedy Library in Boston related to assassination programs against Fidel Castro that has not been opened yet, 50 plus years later, because the Kennedy family, Robert Kennedy's family controls it. Side note, anyways. Uh, so yes, you need to wait. Uh, and it's tough for people who like to get invited on to, you know, the Chris Matthews, you know, hardball or whatever. Um, it's tough now with Twitter. I'm on Twitter. A lot of folks, a lot of historians, scholars are on Twitter. That requires an immediate response to something. Uh, whereas frequently as, as any good journalist, if there are any left, will tell you, first reports about any event are almost always wrong. So people jump right on it, because you want to be first. Uh, but yeah, I'm an absolute believer in the maximum of waiting a minimum of 20 years. I would uh, push back against you a little bit, um, at least within the scholarly community, overwhelmingly so, the hostile remarks, the kinds of things that I just, the litany that I just went through here, you're going, it's disproportionate. Um, 
it's it really is tends to be directed disproportionately against the Republican slash conservative presidents. I mean, John F. Kennedy, who I still have some residue of affection for. My parents were rock solid New Frontiersmen in Massachusetts. Um, was ranked in that C-SPAN survey in February that I just alluded to. It was ranked either seventh or eighth in terms of being the greatest president. Two years, 10 months, and two days in office, and in the top 10. And I could rattle off a list of the names of the people he's uh, exceeded in terms of that. It's just shows a certain, go ahead. Just a, a quick little bit of color. Uh, you mentioned Arthur Schlesinger. Yes. Early example of this. Um, it's always an kind of apologist and a prayer of stories. Uh, there was a glimmer of self-awareness and candor when the self-described high-flying prerogative men Yes. The New Deal, Commodores, Schlesinger, and the others you mentioned. In the 1970s, Schlesinger, speaking of that crowd in particular, commented on that uh, Ed Corwin, these other high flying prerogative men, parachuted safety back to Earth. That's where they really get <laughs> Good. Great. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. I'm just going to say testimony to your findings. You look at the APSA. Uh, catalog of thousands of panels, and in the last years of the Bush presidency, there was no waiting. Every single judgment had been made, over, sure. and it was made over and over and over again. And sure. Last year, my friend and I decided to look through the catalog and see if we could find one single panel <clears throat> that questioned a single thing about Obama. We couldn't find one, at least in terms of the title of, of the panel, sure. and even with Chuck Cable himself saying the world is exploding all over, even in the foreign policy side of things. There was not a panel that, that questioned how we got to this point. Yeah. The atrocities and hostilities escalating all over the world. But my question was, did you, um, in your research, um, highlight any of the progressive scholars and politicians who before 9-11 themselves had said that Hussein and Iraq was such a threat to the world that we might have to use force, including the Clintons, yeah. the various people, and uh, yeah, all kinds of people were. Uh, sure. Uh, that is, I'm sorry, that is in my book on the Bush presidency that Mac mentioned, Rush to Judgment. Um, the piece I wrote for War on the Rocks that caught the attention of Mac and Paul. Uh, I didn't get into that, but yes, I have dealt with that. The fact that, um, in fact, I wrote a piece for the Wall Street Journal, I think in 2013 on the anniversary, the 10th anniversary of the invasion of Iraq, just sort of detailing the support for, that begins in the Clinton years where President Clinton signs the, I forgot the formal title, but commits the United States to regime change in Iraq. And then the fact that George W. Bush's request uh, authorization for the use of force was, you know, supported uh, by some significant Democrats, Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden, John Kerry, uh, the list is fairly lengthy. And the idea, I mean, Jay Rockefeller, the center, a senator from West Virginia, said at some point in 02 or so that he expected Saddam Hussein to have a nuclear capability within five years. I mean, this was just accepted. Most major intelligence services accepted this as well. Uh, it's not a question of Bush lying and people dying, as some folks are still fond of saying. Uh, it was a major intelligence screw up, not just in the United States, but elsewhere. And people need to keep in mind that Saddam's own generals believed that he had these weapons and were waiting for him to use them in 03. He couldn't understand why he hadn't used them. So, um, it was an incredible lie that took hold um, and uh, 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 misled a lot of folks. So, yes, I do deal with that, but elsewhere. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? I think I thought I missed somebody. Um, Mac, please. I was going to say that uh, Winston Churchill said that he would be treated very well by history because he would write it. So that's, uh, 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 that's your, your answer. But just, just one thing. I mean, I uh, Steve has been talking about this much. But he went, we read one of the three great books about how a president is treated over history. 
there's I forget the authors. There's one on Lincoln. There's one on Jefferson, and then there's Steve's on on Hamilton. And it uh, you know it depends in in some cases on the uh, sort of the, the the political winds of the time. Uh, if uh, somebody is a, is adopted by uh, the progressives or somebody else, but at least there's a period of time you can look back and you can make a you can you can make a, a better assessment. We were talking about the fact that uh, who was it uh, uh, the, the guy who reviewed your book and quoted something from Politico or I forget it. Larry Corp. Larry Corp. You know, yeah, I just want to name But uh, yeah, I mean it, it's this going after Steve because it, you know, and Steve said it, he didn't defend Bush. He was critical of his own colleagues in the history field. Basically, do this for us to judgment rather than you know letting the uh, going go, 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 uh, looking at, at something other than the first draft. Yeah. And, I, and I do think it's that's one small contributing factor to what my colleague at the Naval War College, Tom Nichols, has referred to as the death of expertise. Uh, the fact that far too many scholars have been caught up in, in sort of their, their ideological biases have been revealed, but a lot of the public is dismissive, uh, particularly in the social sciences, of this kind of expertise. And it does allow for the rise of alternative facts. It's just one, one small contributor to this phenomenon, which I find to be particularly disturbing. One more question. Yes, sir. The oral history project, too. It's very good. Uh, well, so I used to work at the Miller Center of, of Public Affairs down at UVA, and that's where I did these oral histories. Um, that program still exists. I believe the George W. Bush oral history project is, if it's not completed, it's about to wrap up fairly soon. And those interviews will probably be released. Again, I'm not a spokesman for them, so I'm just guessing here, but I would say two to three years or so. And you can access these interviews online. So for instance, the Reagan oral histories that I did are all available online, at least the folks who have agreed to open their interviews. Part of what we do at, did at the Miller Center was to get these people to open up, you allow them to control when their interview can be released. So occasionally you'll get somebody who will say, I don't want this out until I'm dead or 20 years after I'm dead or whatever. But most of the Reagan material is open. Um, and oral histories aren't, aren't the be-all and end-all, but they're one piece of the puzzle. Uh, and you, I did find in the six years I was involved in this project, you know, I had certain, uh, I had a certain narrative in my mind about the Bill Clinton presidency. We also did their oral history. I found at the end of six years I had a different take on the Clinton presidency. And the same for H.W. Bush and Reagan and W. and so forth. So, you know, it's important for scholars to, not to beat a dead horse, but to try to not get up, get caught up in the passions of the time, but really try to use uh, the power of reason over emotion and let, let those emotions settle before you make these sweeping judgments about a presence. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it.